All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, Dr. Harry Zeit. Harry, welcome. Welcome. Good to be here. All right. So Dr. Harry Zeit, MD, is certified in sensory motor psychotherapy and currently works full-time practicing trauma therapy and psychotherapy. Dr. Zeit is active in the Medical Psychotherapy Association of Canada. He's been involved in teaching and creating educational events in the field of psychotherapy and trauma, bringing together physicians and mental health care workers in order to foster dialogue and build bridges between disciplines. He created the Caring for Self While Caring for Others series to meet what he perceived to be a growing need for the medical profession to face challenges around unremitting stress and burnout and to differentiate these physiology-driven processes from a mental health model which favored treating burnout as anxiety or depression. Dr. Zeit is an advocate for trauma-informed and humane medical and mental health care and is passionate about teaching and cultivating the healing potential of traditional modalities integrated with newer somatic and neuroscience-informed models. So you're you're the one who's doing this. <laughs> well, I'm not alone. But, well, um, sometimes yeah. it, it could certainly seem that way. But look, welcome. I'm really excited to have you here. Before we get go in here, share with our listeners where you're from and where you're uh, calling from, and then let's dive in. I am in Toronto. I was born in Toronto. People still listen to my voice and say, where are you from? And, you know, in some ways, I've always felt like I'm from everywhere, but I've lived my whole life in Toronto, and that's where I am today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, welcome again. So, you know, reading through your, 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 the bio, which would, you know, snippet of it I read through and, uh, you know, looking at your website and and your Facebook community, you know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing. Um, that here we have this, you know, physician, this, uh, MD who's bringing this kind of holistic and integrative awareness to the mental health field. Part of me feels like I just said, like, okay, so we found him. You're the one who's doing this. But like you said, there are others, but not everyone's doing this, certainly with with your background. How, let's get to this story. How, how, what got you here? Well, I started off quite conventionally in medicine. I thought, at least. I, I ended up by default in ER. And I, at that time, I was in no way sophisticated about what drives us and what the tides are beneath. But I just, I always found myself running to the ER. And that led me to 22 years of working in the emergency department. Wow. And that started off in a quiet emergency department. And just the water got hotter very gradually, but very consistently. And I started to notice signs in myself that of stress. I was starting to see it a lot more in others. And I think that that took me to learning ways to cope. And I was always a bit behind the ball. I, as a typical doctor, I didn't jump up and say, I need to do something now because I come from a culture which has a lot of unspoken rules. Mm-hmm. And one of them is, you know, toughen up. Um, suck it up buttercup that kind of thing but I, so so i'm in this culture and you know we're quite expected to to really harden and and the hardening didn't come naturally to me and i'm just not that kind of guy although i could be very calm under pressure and don't know where that came from starting to know where it came from now but i started to do yoga and I got very serious into yoga for probably the last um, over five years maybe even 10 years in my medical career and and that started to introduce me to people that were outside the model I'd been trained in but I was really resonating with them and feeling connected to them and feeling that these worlds could connect to my world so a lot changed in, in fact because uh, I I crashed and burned in a small way towards the end of ER. Um, things were changing in my life. Um, I think yoga kind of, without doing any sort of active reflection, it took me apart in a way that I could put things back together again. 
So I went through a huge changes in my life at around age 40. I had sort of the prototypical dark night of the soul. And during that time, I was beginning to realize I wasn't going to stay in the ER forever. And I started to do annual retreats in Massachusetts to the Kripalu Yoga Center, following in the footsteps of people like Deirdre Fay that also made that move. And I realized I was much more interested in the, the group personal growth, the psychotherapy programs there, which, and I'd, I remember um, there was a time I was really kind of lost and I saw a doctor named Yvonne Kaysen. And Yvonne Kaysen wrote a book about, she had several near-death experiences and she was interviewing people doing Kundalini awakenings. And I went and I saw her she was involved in something called the Spirituality and Healthcare Network in Toronto. And it's, she, we made a really good connection and she looked at me and she said, well, what are you gonna do next? And I said, well, I'm thinking of palliative care maybe. And she looked at me and said, you don't wanna be working with dying people. You're too young, you're too full of life. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, I, I signed up for a one year training program in Gestalt and uh, Buddhist psychology, and, and that sort of got me moving in this other direction. But at the same time, I, I never really lost my footing in medicine. So I did uh, ER for five more years part time until my 47, 2005, and then I made the move into psychotherapy. Wow. But it, I still made that move through uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons here, so it was quite supervised and uh, unlike other people that decided to leave medicine i said there's there's a lot of good things in medicine too and i really felt that if i could bridge the worlds i could take the best from both um so I, you know I, I mentioned your uh your series that you've developed caring for self or caring for others so did when did that come about in, within the context of what you're sharing here so that came a bit later and because I didn't immediately get right into trauma. I just was going to be a psychotherapist. I was doing a Jungian analysis. I, I was much more into the personal growth area, but I think the ER doctor in me, I kept seeing trauma everywhere and I saw things because of my training and really in ER, we notice very subtle signs. We notice changes in skin color. Hmm. We notice, um, the things that make a difference because you have to act very quickly. So if we see someone going into shock and we catch them an hour before the next guy, that can be life and death. So I was seeing these patients and I'm saying, I don't know what the psychiatrists are missing, but I am seeing state changes. I am seeing um, the moving in the sympathetic and parasympathetic and going blanched and going red. So that, I just kept reading and I was reading people like Robert Scare and saying, yes, yes, this is what I'm seeing. And, and so it was like I had to learn trauma because if I wasn't learning trauma, I wasn't doing justice to my patients. So once that came about, I said, well, I'm seeing it in doctors too. I'm seeing it all around me. It wasn't as profound as working with people with DID or complex PTSD, but I was seeing a lot of signs of it. So that was one thing. And the other thing, was that I had started to train in sensory motor. I really wanted to train in internal family systems. I had seen Dick Schwartz present at Kripalu. I was like, this is awesome. But I got tired of waiting for Dick to come to Canada, which is actually happening now. And somebody said, well, this program called Sensory Motor really wants to start a hub in Toronto. So I jumped in and I never looked back. Wow. And, and then, from my sensory motor, I said, you know, what I'm seeing in medicine, what I'm seeing in the world is that when we are stressed, you know, these subcortical brain regions take over and this is just happening and it's going to happen more and more. So I had read a book about that time, but Laura Vendernik-Lipsky, who I think you've interviewed, Trauma Stewardship. Yep. And... I sat with that book and I said, I have to do this series. And I was lucky that someone had twisted my arm to become an education chair for a section in the Ontario Medical Association. And so 
after a, a year, I just taught trauma just didactically and 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 that was a hard sell for doctors. But then after that first year, I said, look, if you want me to do the job and bring in speakers and do all this extra work, I want this series. And they said, OK. And that was the beginning of caring for self. Why was um, teaching trauma a hard sell for physicians? Because it goes against the grain of a lot of what we've learned. A lot of the medical model is still about genetics and that diseases just have a way of arriving through our genes and, and didn't, doesn't look at the environmental factors that sustain trauma. I think the other hard sell was that it were a conservative profession. Things get very entrenched. Um, we under a lot of responsibility, so people try and play by the rules. And trauma is very challenging because it starts to say, you know, life really impacts people and we don't, can't control life. And it also s starts to say that, yeah, like trauma is a very dynamic force and it, it acts upon the rhythms of the body. It's not fixable by a pill. So I think that was part of it. And the other part is by nature, nobody wants to look at trauma. As a species, we're built to dissociate from pain and we do all kinds of things, you know, to, to run away from trauma, to run away from pain. And I think medicine has its own built-in ways of avoiding trauma. And those are starting to break down now. So life is getting quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's very interesting uh, to me what you're saying, because not only the fact that here you are a, a physician, uh, looking at trauma, but also, as we know, and as we talk a lot about on this podcast, in order to do that, in order to work with someone who's been impacted by trauma, the clinician, the therapist, the, that that person has to be have a, a certain cultivated level of self-awareness, right? Has to have done that own inner work. Like you're talking about, you were really drawn to look at that within yourself. And um, that's very challenging. It's not always pleasant. Like you said, we're a species that doesn't want to look at uh, trauma and we'll do a lot to, to avoid looking at it. So how are you, um, you know, how are you continuing to, 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 to do that? And I guess even before I ask you that question, you strike me as someone who's on a mission. I mean, just by the very nature of, of what you are and your background and how it's evolved, wh what would you say your, your, your mission is in a sense? That's a question that, wow, I, I need to sit and reflect upon it. I do get it reflected back to me often. And I think the mission is to move people along to build a consciousness along in medicine and I'm not alone anymore which is a little reassuring uh, and hopeful uh, that it's it just it's it's a sinking boat at this point I think in many ways and so I think the mission is to sh help elaborate the path out of that boat to something better and to do it in a way that meets both the needs of clients or patients and the physicians as well, because physicians are suffering a great deal as well. So I don't think it's a fanatical mission. I think it's a gentle mission. And part of my own journey is to make that more gentle. I think earlier on, I was more in people's face and that is not a good way to bring people to, to transform it. It's transformation, whether you're doing sensory motor sessions or whether you're doing teaching really needs to be gentle. It needs to honor where people are in their nervous systems, in their body and in their readiness to change. I, I, I find it hard imagining you uh, getting in people's faces. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, people look at me and say, how did you do ER? But, you know, I have a self-state that can be challenging, and it comes out now and again. And But I think one of my strengths are that I can talk to uh, people, and I can translate different languages to mm -hmm. people, and that I can be patient. 
and that puts me in a good place to to work in both the medical profession and outside of it. So I say in my good days, I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I have my medical community and I have my psychotherapy, my sensory motor community. On my bad days, I don't know who I have mm -hmm. in that, but um, it sort of fluctuates back and forth. In that. And most days are good days. Do, do, uh, does, is the medical community and the therapy community, those different parts within yourself, are they are they are they settled within yourself? Does 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 one you know you talked about the medical profession being conservative and kind of a sinking boat in a sense? Do they is there friction there, inherent friction there, or have you made peace with that and been able to kind of like dance with both parts, if you will? Oh, it's a dance, and and I think it's important to realize nobody's to blame. You know, doctors have are really in, in very many ways beholden to a system that's quite rigid. And it's just that system is having trouble adapting to so many social forces, so many forces beyond the control of medicine in that. So, but I, I have always been proud to be a doctor and, and that MD after my name has given me no end of opportunity. So I'm grateful for that and, and grateful for many of the lessons I've learned. Uh, ER, taught me many things that I really hold true. It, it, and although ER is beyond the medical community, it's a community of first responders and nurses and lab techs, but it taught me the power that community can be created as well. And you know that is something that is always a challenge for the psychotherapy community where we do so much of our work alone. That, so I love that I've done both. I love that the things I did in the ER were so witnessed by so many people. And, you know, I love the mysterious alchemy as well as what happens alone with one person in the therapy room too. So are you, are you teaching now uh, in, in uh, medical school? Um, I do um, a, a little teaching. I'm doing a lecture at McMaster Medical School in September on trauma. Uh, but most of the teaching I do is, is small groups. And unfortunately, there's some hunkering down. And, and right now, there's more competition to get in and do the teaching. Mm -hmm. So, and I've, with my partner, we've gotten more involved in starting more sensory based groups and, and working with small groups of people. And I think we're going to throw that at the physician health program. We've had a couple of doctors do the program and they've liked it. And that's, but I'll, I'll always have some opportunities to teach. But it's, how, are you, how are you introducing this, uh, your perspective in a sense that comes from, you know, not just sensory motor psychotherapy, but, but from that, how are you introducing your perspective and knowledge and awareness of uh, trauma in a sense to young, you know, medical students who may be entering into that profession in a, what conservative way with a certain mindset, let's say that maybe isn't as, as open. It's very interesting because some are not and some are because there's also some young medical students that really want to hear about trauma informed care. And they're working with highly traumatized populations like in Toronto, a Syrian refugees say, and they're seeing trauma every day and they realize that. So I'm not alone. I have some support and, and, and it's that support that's actually kept me teaching because mm -hmm. I'm up against sort of this monolithic structure. But some of the young doctors, they say, this guy is really important and we want him heard and we want you to bring him in. So I'm grateful to those people. I think the trauma-informed care model is a really great way in. And when people start hearing about, especially the survival defenses and that you know, you're not going to shift somebody that's in a freeze or that goes right into dorsal vagal collapse. Well, if you, you know, put out stuff like Porges's work and you put out some slides and you bring in the science, it's pretty convincing at this point. So I think that is really the way to go. If I'm off and I'm going to talk about stuff that's more uh, 
sort of in the psychotherapy sphere, it's not going to go over so well. But if I can speak the language of medicine and then begin to bring in my own personal experience or my work with clients, that's something that's going to land with people. And even if it lands with a few people, that's planting seeds. Mm -hmm. And I find that when, when people really get trauma-informed care or people really resonate personally and they say, I see something in myself, I see something I'm carrying that may have led to me going into medicine. And if that happens early enough in a medical career, that can really shape how people go. And it's a much nicer way than physicians not looking at their trauma and then say getting a chronic illness and then looking at their trauma. So my hope is they're gonna start to say, oh, you know, I noticed the relationships I chose or that I like these high adrenaline environments that this might be a sign that I'm dealing with something and I wanna look at it and then I can look at it in myself and look at it in my patients. So, you know, there, there is that strong human element in medicine and it's just a matter of finding, I think, the pace in the space to be able to connect with people. There aren't that many opportunities because people are burdened and stressed and working hard, but those moments do occur and they're very magical. And I've experienced them. It, yeah. it sounds to me like you've uh, almost been able to live the both, both the best worlds in a sense. Um, uh, you know, working through um, the ER and having that experience for, 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 for many, many years and then getting to a point where you almost it, it sounds like it, and I don't mean to make this sound trite, but kind of discovered this other part of yourself in a sense was, you know, in, with sensory motor psychotherapy and, and that kind of type of awareness. Was, was that always there? Did you feel that longing always there or did it kind of uh, unfold or even explode when you were going through that, uh, your own kind of burnout and trauma, if you will? I think it was always there. And that's one of the reasons I went into ER, actually, was because I had enough, enough time off that I could read and self-explore. But it, it kind of went underground, and I lost touch with it, which is tragic, I think, for a while, and lost touch with myself. And it's almost as if myself drove me back, in a way. And it said after a while that, you know, there's it's really exciting to do procedures, to, to get a lumbar puncture at 4 a.m. in the morning. But there, there was something else in my soul calling to me. It's like, the, you've done that. And it was starting you know, as well, that it, it's not a lifetime career. So it was a bit survival, but something that worked out as well, because you know we really don't have great roles for a lot of people in the first responder positions. You know, you work your heart out and you kind of get tired of it. And so I was fortunate that that little piece of my soul was always there, which is a bit like working with trauma people, that mm -hmm. amazing that no matter what people have experienced, even, you know, you do years of work and then somebody tells you, oh, there's this little piece of me, you know, I never told you about, but, you know, every night when my father was coming up into my bedroom and raping me, I put it away in a safe place because I knew I'd want it one day. Mm. And, you know, I, I love that, that, you know, we all have those places. And, and I think my journey helped to remind me that, you know, it, it wasn't nearly as extreme for me, but I somehow kept that place. But there were periods when it, I think I was working so hard and so tired and I was shutting down that I did lose touch with that. And that's a danger in medicine that we can you know, do it. So I'm happy to have it back. One of the things that uh, strikes me about you, Harry, is uh, uh, you know a, a, a certain a, a great actually self awareness that that you brought uh, here, not only to your life but but to this podcast, and it's it's resonating with me because. It, I think it's a, a, a challenge for, for us to 
you know, ask ourselves these questions and to, to respond and, and to follow what we're feeling in our, in our guts and, and uh, in our hearts, in, in a sense. Um, and I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, I just want to say that I, I, I just value that and I, and I love it. And it, there, to me, there's a message in it for, for all of our listeners, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if that type of self-awareness and is almost, you know, antithetical to working in the medical field. And I don't want to say that sound, that sound disparaging because I also think in a sense, in the same way that having a certain um, self-awareness or, or recognition is almost detrimental if you're in the military field, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So let me throw that over to you and, and see what, how you re reply. You know, I've given that some thought lately and, it's one thing that comes up. If I'm talking to a group of, say, doctors involved in mental health, it's easier. But if, say, I'm talking to surgeons, that, you know, they're, they're really resilient guys up to a point. And that's the problem is that it's up to a point. And even they crash and burn. And, and I think that's something that we have to work out well because some people don't need to go there and they'll survive mm -hmm. but everybody has that breaking point um, you know i'm thinking we have this famous coroner here and he's he was a like super anti-ptsd he said you know we are tough ass doctors and we 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 do not need to we do not get trauma and he was working on quite a quite a an ugly serial murder case and he got awful PTSD and he turned around and changed his tune. It is quite a famous story here in Ontario. And that's the problem is that we don't know what doctors will hit their wall, but for those doctors that do hit their walls, even in high performance things and probably the same for military too, if they're not self-aware, if they haven't done some prep work, then, they're often pretty splattered on the floor. You know, mm -hmm. often they're addicted, their marriages have fallen apart, their kids aren't talking to them. Sometimes they lose their licenses. And we see these horror stories in medicine and in the military and in police, and it's very sad. So I'm thinking that the ideal program would probably be gentle. And so now I'm looking at, well, at least can we start by learning to track our nervous systems, kind of check what's happening in their body. And if our body's screaming every day, maybe we need to start talking to other people and kind of opening up things and kind of dealing things in a stepwise fashion. Because the problem is that these tough people, they don't track themselves at all. They just stuff it all down and they're tough until the day they're not tough anymore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's an argument out there that says, well, certain people don't need to do that. You know, if I, if I'm having a, uh, uh, if I need a surgery done, I want, I don't care if my surgeon is meditating or doing yoga. I want the surgery done. And similarly, you know, if we're in war, I want, you know, I don't care if that Navy SEAL does yoga or not. Can they, can they handle the situation? But what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is we each, as humans, have our breaking point. And there has to be a certain level, a modicum at least, level of self-awareness for protection almost. Yeah. And, and I think actually that's where trauma therapy and the trauma model is great. Because what these guys are scared of is people are going to take them right into their emotions and, and sometimes open their system in a way that makes them soft and vulnerable. I mean, I don't want to go to war and every time I see, you know, someone with a burn, I start crying. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be effective, but I, but by going through the body and the nervous system, that's a, a way in which it doesn't make us so vulnerable. It doesn't crack us open. And, and I think the trauma model also tells us that we can really work on that level of, of sorry, co-regulation rather than self 
self-discovery. So I think um, a lot of what the best that this model can offer is, is to have people co-regulate one another. And to a certain extent, the military does that well. You know, they, soldiers in World War I, they, some people say only one out of 10 actually shot their guns, the rest were in freeze. But now the military trains so well that people are tight there in a the unit, and that's very protective. And so I think, you know, we, we need to learn ways. And also, I think the trauma model teaches us we got to be cognizant of that breaking point. So just little interventions like the Dutch military parking their soldiers on a Greek island for a month to, to just let their nervous system unwind before they bring them back home is helpful. And maybe that's what your heart surgeon needs. He doesn't need to talk about his feelings. He needs to give his nervous system a rest and, and you know, maybe talk in a, a way that's not too revealing, but just to make sure he's able to share his feelings and soften up and kind of be in the window of tolerance and social engagement. And uh, so, you know, the problem right now is so much is unremitting. Our nervous systems never get a break. So I'm not necessarily saying, you know, I need every surgeon to talk about how they were for and their father shamed them and they felt really bad. And now they, you know, they're all armored up and they walk around the world and, you know, they're protected. I mean, they can probably live without going there. But, you know, that still puts them at risk for, for dysregulation and for isolating. So those things need to be caught. And, and if we catch them early, I think then we can say, well, those people that, that are caught, well, maybe they do need therapy. Maybe they do need to look at that wound. So, mm. yeah. All right, Harry. Um, how about a go-to book recommendation, whether trauma-related or not, or medically related or not? What do, you, what do you have for us? So I thought I'd offer you all the books I recommend are books your readers have recommended so much. So my recommendation is so important for new trauma therapists to get into your body and as well to understand your journey. So I'm, I'm going to recommend this. I do a somatic meditation practice, which is very connected to trauma by a guy named Reg, Reggie Ray. And which is a really, he has, I'm doing a, and hard opening practice. So his book, The Awakening Body by Reggie Ray. Okay. And I'm also going to recommend a Jungian guy, James Hollis, H-O-L-L-I-S. Um, he does a lot of book about finding meaning in life. And I think to really help us connect with the work we're doing to find our own personal meaning in that. I think this really help connect with trauma work. Awesome. I appreciate that. Okay. So Reggie Ray and James Hollis, again, we'll have those listed up uh, at the show notes page at thetraumatherapistpodcast.com. So where can people find you, Harry? Well, as of yesterday evening, they can find me on my website, which is harrysitemd.com. And that will have links to my Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Harry Zeit, uh, MD.com. Again, we'll have that linked up. All right, Harry. Um, you are truly inspiring, and uh, I think you're going to at least be invited back on this podcast. I'd love to have you back and just to hear about your discovery and uh, what you have going on. But I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Great, and thank you for the work you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you for saying that. Take care. Bye-bye.